We come for our scripture reading this morning to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 11 and 12. The 20th century opened with great optimism. People believed that we were moving into a golden age. World War I and World War II put an end to that optimism, and all of those things led to pessimistic existentialism. And the belief that there is no meaning to life, that it is pointless, that death brings an end to everything, and there will not, in fact, be a better day. We had similar ideas in the first century. We see that in the passage that we are reading for our scripture. Paul is addressing believers who were from the Gentile world. And you'll note as we read this, he said that at one time you were a people who lived with no hope. Ephesians 2, let's begin the reading in verse 11. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul contends that the person who decides to live without Christ and without God in his days in this world, in fact, has no hope for the future. They do not have a bright future. What a sad thing to live without hope. But well, we today are reflecting upon the subject, waiting with hope for the life of eternity. We have three main points. Number one, a great change has happened in our lives. We once lived without God and without hope, but now we have hope in our hearts. Number two, we want to consider how we should describe the hope that is in us. This is an expectation that our hope will in fact be realized and we are to have a future orientation and not dwell excessively on the sins of the past. And number three, we want to consider what the hope of the divine call actually is. The hope that we have is focused upon the second coming of Christ and the salvation that he will bring and that he will bring a new heaven and a new earth. You'll note here in Ephesians chapter 1 that Paul in the midst of a prayer for those who have faith in Christ and those who have love for all the saints, verse 15, mentions a prayer request in verse 18. Here it is, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. The calling of God, the effectual call, brings hope. We find a similar sentiment in Romans 15:13. When he says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, this is a supernatural thing. When a person is abounding in hope concerning the future, this is effected in him or her by the Holy Spirit. Of God. Now Peter in 1 Peter 3.15 makes the assumption that the believer is in fact someone who has hope. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts 
and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Peter assumes that we have hope within us and that people will observe the fact that we do have hope and some of them will ask us why do you have hope for a bright tomorrow? Peter says be ready to give a defense, an explanation as to why you have this fundamental optimism concerning the future. We come to our second point. How should we describe the hope that is in us? Well, it is not a mere wish, but it is an expectation that will actually find fulfillment. We see the use of this particular word, hope, in the book of Philemon, a fascinating little letter from Paul to a man named Philemon who had a church which met in his house. There were no church buildings in the early centuries of church history. He says, Paul does in the first verse, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. Now he knows that Philemon is praying for him. Paul is in prison. And he says, For I trust, in the New American Standard Bible, rightly recognizes that it is the word elpidzo, which means hope. I hope that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. He fully expects that prayer accomplishes things and that he will be released. In fact, he's so confident, he says in verse 22, but meanwhile also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. He is totally confident that he is going to be released from prison and ask Philemon, prepare a room for me when I come to visit. Well, we have this hope focused upon the second coming of Christ. We are absolutely certain that it will happen. We are more certain of the second coming of Christ than the pew that we are sitting on. And we have this expectation that this hope will be realized in the future. Philippians chapter 3 is a fascinating passage where Paul is speaking about himself and he acknowledges that he himself has not morally arrived yet. He says in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Now Paul, as you read about it in the book of Acts, and as he writes about it in 1 Timothy, committed some very serious offenses. And he did not spend his time focused upon the past. He says, one thing I do, forgetting those things are, which are behind, and this is how we too should conduct ourselves, and not dwell upon the mistakes and the sins of the past. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And you notice this future orientation in verse 4, 14. He says, I press toward the goal. Paul has the finish line in front of him. The finish line is moral perfection. And he's pressing toward that goal of moral perfection. And he's pressing forward toward a prize. He wants the prize. It's not a wreath which they would give, a wreath of leaves in the ancient Olympics, but he defines it as the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, the prize of being called to heaven. So we have to have this future orientation. Yes, we do make confession of our sin, we do turn from it, but then we need to move on. Paul shows us how to live. 
We come to point number three, what the hope of the divine call actually is. Here we're looking at the substance of our hope. You remember that in Ephesians 1.18, Paul prays that we might know what is the hope of God's call, the content of the hope. Well, the content of the hope is actually our future salvation. Thomas Schreiner, who's one of the great New Testament scholars of our time, teaches in Louisville, Kentucky, makes the point, and I quote, salvation for Paul is primarily a future reality. Now, we have been saved, past tense, we are being saved, present tense, but the emphasis in Paul is on the fact that we shall be saved. This happens in connection with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus, the historical Jesus of Nazareth, who lived, who preached, who did miracles, who was crucified, who died, and who was buried, and who was raised again from the dead, who ascended into heaven, that very same God-man will return. Now we see this in the book of 1 Thessalonians, so if you turn over there, let me call your attention to a couple of statements in each of the five chapters, beginning in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 9, where Paul identifies what a Christian is. This definition and explanation is as good as any, 1 Thessalonians 1 9. He's talking about what happened in Thessalonica. He says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now you'll note there that that's conversion. Conversion means that there's a turning to God and a turning from idols. Turning to, turning from. But then note the other characteristic of what a believer is, a converted person, verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So that is where we are at. We are waiting for the son of God, and you'll note there the future aspect of salvation. He says, Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. That is a future deliverance from the wrath of God, which we poured out on the last day. Now, if you turn over to chapter 2, he uses the word hope. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Again, he uses the word parousia, translated coming. And the great thing, the great hope that he had, the thing that caused him great joy was the thought that the people to whom he ministered would be there in the very presence of the Lord when he comes back, safely there in his presence. So our hope is directed to the future. You note chapter 3, verse 12. He says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. There it is again, the second coming. Here we find the truth that all of those who died, who were then taken to heaven, when he returns, he will return with his saints. Chapter 4, he continues with this theme of the second coming. Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Not everyone is going to die. There will be a generation which is alive and which remains when the Lord comes. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The image of a returning king descending. Now, as to when all of this is going to happen, we don't have an answer in Scripture. In fact, no one knows. It would be pointless to try to guess. And yet, we do have some characteristics about this. If you turn over to chapter 5, and verse 1, he says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord succumbs as a thief in the night. The idea is that it will be an unexpected event. A thief does not announce the time of his coming. 
But there is a sign which shows that his coming is imminent. It's in verse 3. This will be the phenomenon in international politics at the time. He says, for when they say peace and safety. That's what people are going to be saying, that we've entered this new era of peace. And what's going to happen? He says, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Now he's talking about people in unbelief. Upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. There is no escape from this wrath of God, the judgment of God. But Paul consoles us in verse 4, and you see the contrast between them and you. He says, but you, brethren, you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. The day of the Lord, the day of judgment, it's not going to overtake you in that way. It's going to overtake them, but it's not going to overtake you who are the brethren who have come to Jesus Christ and who have found refuge in Him. He says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. We have embraced, you see, the Lord Jesus Christ as the light of the world, as our Savior. He says in verse 8, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that underscores the statement of Thomas Schreiner that salvation is this future event. That's what he's talking about, a future event that we are going to obtain salvation. We're going to obtain this deliverance from the wrath of God. We have not been appointed to wrath. History ends with the outpouring of the wrath of God. Read the book of Revelation. It's very clear. No, we shall obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, who died for us, whether we wake or sleep, we shall live together with him. Now that is a description of the life of eternity. You say, what does eternity look like? That's what it looks like. We will live together with him. It's not just one of us who is with him, that it is all who have put their trust in him. They are with him forever. Now, Augustine, many years ago in the early 400s in North Africa and modern Algeria, right on the Mediterranean Sea, wrote his magnum opus, The City of God. I've given the quote to you there on your key biblical and theological text sheet where Augustine writes about our hope. He says he, he's talking about Jesus Christ, he will be the goal of our longings and we shall see him forever. That's the life of eternity. We shall see him forever. We shall love him without satiety. That is, we're not going to be so filled up that we do not want any more of him. He says we shall praise him without wearying. This will be the duty, the delight, the activity of all shared by all who share the life of eternity. Will you be part of the life of eternity? Will you be there seeing him, rejoicing in him, praying, praising him forever? The question is where is all of this activity going to take place? where we surround Jesus Christ, well, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Let's close by looking at 2 Peter chapter 3. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3. We're thinking here about this present evil age in which we now live, as Paul calls it in Galatians 1.4. We recognize that history can be very very depressing. It is the story of human depravity. Will God ever put a stop to the unrighteousness that dominates in history and Holy Scripture says yes he will put a stop. Now we don't have time to read about the cosmic fire that precedes this passage but that fire of purification is going to bring a whole new kind of life we have never seen this before. Notice 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is not true 
of the present. Yes, there are these small pockets of righteousness in the midst of the kingdom of God, in the midst of God's holy people, but the light of righteousness is barely holding its own on a larger level than these small congregations scattered everywhere. Peter is saying that righteousness will dominate in all places throughout the new heavens and the new earth. There will be righteousness. There will be a new heavens, he says, a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now since there is righteousness a measuring up to the law of God, that means there will be the perfection of love and harmony and peace and happiness. That's how you get love, harmony, peace, and happiness only if you have righteousness. Now that will happen on a cosmic level in the universe. And Peter then draws an application with respect to the individual Christian currently now in our lives. Notice what he says in verse 14. And notice the word therefore. In light of this the macrocosm, righteousness. What should we do on the individual level right now? He says, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent. Notice that. Don't slough off. Don't be slothful. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Now that's the question that each of us must ask ourselves, how will Jesus Christ find me? Now, he will find us. The question is, how will he find us? And we must ask ourselves, will he find me in peace? Will he find me without spot? Will he find me blameless? Will he find me loving the brethren? Let us ask God that this will be the case.